actually getting guidance from the Quran, that pathway, that road leads only through tadabbur. Tadabbur means deep contemplation. Like you cannot engage in not thinking, not consciously and deeply focused thinking about the Quran and what Allah is saying and expect to get guidance. It will not make itself apparent to you with a shallow exposure. Now sometimes you know what happens, you're just, and I'm not saying that you have to be a scholar, so please understand the difference between contemplating the word of Allah and interpreting or researching and studying the word of Allah. There's a, those are two different things. You know, the jinns were passing by when the Prophet ﷺ was reciting the Quran, right? And they, they said, hold on, hold on, hold on, what, what's going on? And they started deeply thinking about what was being said. Right, that act of thinking, and maybe you didn't understand everything you thought thought about, but it it raised serious questions for you. It made you think, and it made you want to ask, "What is what is this about?" And look further and look deeper. That act itself is tadabbur, actually. So they stopped and they started listening. Yes, the al Quran, falamma, you know, qudiya. Um, فَلَمَا حَضَرُوهُ قَالُوا أَنْصِتُوا When uh, Surah Al-Hakaf, Allah says, when they came into the presence of the Qur'an being recited, it's pretty amazing. Qur'an is not a place. Qur'an is sounds, right? And Allah describes that the jinn that were passing by, when they came into its presence, as if the Qur'an sounds are like a presence. You are in the presence of royalty when you are hearing the words of the Qur'an. So when they found themselves in its presence, قَالُوا أَنْصِتُوا They said, Stop talking and listen. Stop talking and pay attention. Ansitu. Which is again incredible because when you come in the presence of royalty, all the talking stops. Oh, the king is here. Or the court, the judge walked into the court, right? And every, all the talking stops. And so this idea of being in awe of royalty and no distractions possible, everything that's coming out is as a royal decree, we better pay full attention. And our well-being depends on it. That attitude was demonstrated by the jinn who didn't even know what the Qur'an was. The moment they heard even a little bit of it, أَنْسِتُوا فَلَمَّا قُضِيَ وَلَّوْا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِمْ مُنْذِرِينَ When it was done, then they went back to their nation and started warning them. It's an incredible description of what it means to contemplate the Qur'an actually. Now these jinns are not scholars. They're not like مُفَسِرِينَ they're, they're none of these things. But they just heard even a little bit of the word of Allah, but they gave it full attention. So one dimension of contemplating the word of Allah is not allowing yourself to be distracted uh, while the Qur'an is calling for something more fundamental, which is contemplation. Now, there are ways in which people are distracted, meaning they don't even think about the Qur'an, they don't have time for it, etc. But even people that have Qur'an in their life, this came up in previous discussion, but I'll repeat it here because it's relevant here. People that have Qur'an in their life have reduced the Qur'an to sounds. Many of them have just reduced the Qur'an to sacred sounds. Memorization. Memorization is incredible, but its purpose is to help you contemplate. That's its purpose. It's, that was a means to a goal. This, this never, memorization was never the means. And it's so tragic that today around the world we tell, our, we tell ourselves, oh my children's learning, my child's learning Qur'an. No, they're not learning Qur'an, they're learning memorization. Learning Qur'an means to learn, and con learn to comp contemplate the word of Allah. That's actually learning Qur'an. Learning Tajweed is not learning Qur'an. It's learning something that will lead to learning Qur'an. Learning memorization is not learning Qur'an. It will lead to learning Qur'an. These are all, so what we did was we took these steps and we made them the goal. So congratulations, you finished memorizing, which is an amazing thing. But if you stop there, then not congratulations, it's a tragedy. That's actually a tragedy. So it, it deserves contem deep contemplation. And then for those who are not memorizing the Qur'an, Ramadan has become the month of the Qur'an. What does that mean? I'm going to finish reciting it in the month of Ramadan. Right? I'm just going to finish reciting it. Okay. You're going to finish reciting it because every haraka will give you, or every, sa every letter will give you, every harf will give you ten good deeds. Wonderful. But have you read the Qur'an about people who read Allah's book and don't think about it? Isn't it ironic that you're reading the words, afala taqilun? Don't you then think? Don't you then contemplate? And you're not contemplating? Isn't it ironic that you're reciting the words, afala yatadabbaruna al-Qur'ana, am ala qulubin aqfaluha, and moving forward? Don't they then contemplate the Qur'an, or are their hearts, do their hearts have their own locks on them? Right? Uh, they, they hear the word of Allah and they They threw it behind their backs as if they don't even know. Right? 
we're engaged in this act of devotion by reciting Allah's word, but we forget that the recitation of Allah's word, where did that habit come from? Where did that tradition come from? It came from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, who used to recite the Qur'an day and night. But guess what? They never recited it mindlessly. So we took one portion of their culture, which is to recite the Qur'an continuously. And we abandoned another part of their culture, which is to think about it as they are reciting. That's contemplation. So deep thinking about the Qur'an, spending time and actually engaging with the word of Allah is one of its rights. So that doesn't mean that you shouldn't memorize a surah until you've contemplated the whole surah. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying, just like we give time to bettering our reading, or time to maybe just reciting the Qur'an for benefit, or for review of memorization, just like that there's a time that needs to be dedicated for the goal of it all, which is to contemplate the word of Allah. And you should definitely start with the surahs you've already memorized. If you already memorized Fatiha, Alhamdulillah, Baqarah, or maybe you didn't memorize Baqarah, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, inna a'tayna kal kawthar. You memorize those surahs, go read about those surahs. Go listen to lectures on those surahs. I don't care whose lectures, mine, somebody else's. If, they, if you find something beneficial, listen to it. Learn about it. So the stuff that's already inside you, the short surahs that are already inside you, don't just say, oh, I read the translation so I know what it means. Is translation the same as contemplating? You're again, you're content with the surface? and you don't think there's anything deeper going on, that's again under, undervaluing the Qur'an, which is another prerequisite I already talked about, right? You assume that you already know what it means. It has no more richness to offer. It has no more depth to offer. The translation covered everything I had to know, right? There's no more deeper, deeper involvement necessary from me. So tadabbur is actually its true benefit, its true uh, um, purpose, because through it the heart gets unlocked. Through it, one finds their conviction in the word of Allah. Through it, their iman is rejuvenated. Through it, they really see their own flaws. Through it, they find strength. Through it, they find hope. The, the things we're looking for in the Qur'an will come through the act of tadabbur, and ultimately that will be Allah's guidance. Um, what I wanted to also talk to you about today a little bit is the uh, etymology, the origin of the word guidance, uh, hudan. And in Arabic, it's interesting that the word hada and its, its derivatives were used for the neck of an animal. Four-legged animals, like uh, sheep, etc., their necks uh, are also for, related to the word hada. Uh, and, the re and the reason they're called that is, if the animal's neck is a certain way, you know it's heading in that direction. So unlike human beings, you know, we, we could be standing still, but if the, the, the neck of an animal is actually telling you the, the direction which is pointing, the place in which it's heading. So the imagery associated with uh, Hidayah and Hadi is heading forward towards something or leading towards something. And the, the idea of guidance is something, someone leading you down a certain path in a particular direction, to point in a particular direction, and to put something forward. And that's why actually even uh, you know, Ahda is actually Ahtafa or athafa rather, to give a gift, to put forward a gift, is the word hadi in Arabic. From it we learn that the word huda in the Qur'an is generally being used to describe Allah showing you the way. Let's, let's put it in that sense, showing you the way. Here's the good way, here's the wrong way. When Allah guides someone, more often than not in the Qur'an, what's Allah saying? Allah has shown them the way to go. That's it. Whether or not they decide to take that, that step is up to them. We guided them to the path. It's up to them if they want to be grateful or they want to be ungrateful. The, the, both choices. I've guided you to both. We guided him to both pathways. I showed you this is the path to destruction. This is the path to saving yourself. I've guided you to, see, be, to be able to see what each of them leads to. I've guided you to be able to visualize heaven. I've guided you to be able to visualize hell. Now it's up to you. <laughs> the doors have been shown to you. So guidance from Allah is actually essentially opening your eyes. Here's what reality is. And you know what? Just like in life, if, uh, if one of your kids or yourself even are slacking, right? Or you're messing up. Or you're not fulfilling some responsibility. And somebody in the family says, we need to talk. You already know what the talk is going to be about. You've been missing your homeworks or you haven't been doing some responsibilities, or you've been messing up on something, right? And you know the talk is coming. And when the talk, somebody who's going to be real with you is going to lay out, hey, this is what you need to be doing, and I know that you're not doing this, this, and this, or you did this, this, and this. 
And nobody likes to be in that position. It's like an ugly situation to be in. You want to run from it. You don't want to face a position where things are being pointed out. Right? This is what you're doing wrong. This is what you're saying wrong. This is what you're not fulfilling. These are the obligations you're overlooking. And we'd rather not face or confront ugly reality. Right? But people who truly love you will actually show you what's what and have you give you the chance to think about it and not let you escape that conversation. Like there'll be an intervention, there'll be a confrontation, what you can even call tough love, but it's not out of hate, it's out of love for you. Sometimes you need to face a reality. Sometimes you need to have a harsh conversation. That's necessary. And that's part of Allah's guidance too. Sometimes Allah has very harsh conversations with us, but we need it. Sometimes Allah gives us a look in the mirror and it's not a good look. Uh, well, we need it. It's a reality check. So it's not a feel-good book. It's not a... The Qur'an is not just giving you guidance that makes you, you know, you know, takes you in a field of flowers and butterflies and rainbows. It's not like that. It's not a bed of roses. Sometimes it is. Sometimes Allah will fill, fill me with hope. And He will give me... He will make me optimistic. Other times He will actually... I'll feel humiliated by, by reading Allah's word. Because in some, t in some cases, the slave being humiliated before his rab is necessary. Humbled and humiliated is actually necessary. There's a khudu' there's a powerlessness, there's a maskana before Allah. There's a crying and begging before Allah. We're not, we're not supposed to be humiliated and vulnerable before any other human being or humbled before another human being in the way that we are before Allah. We're not supposed to be confessing all of our flaws to anybody else and coming to Him and expressing how wrong we've been and how we want to make things right and humble ourselves like no one else. We, we have to do that with Allah. And so Allah will open that door for us to be able to do that. It's therapeutic actually. It's kind of a spiritual therapy in the Qur'an. That conversation that you and I have with Allah. Today, I want to talk to you about Rahmah. Allah says, وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً That the, this speech is of, of the final thing Allah mentions that this Qur'an is Rahma. The speech of Allah is Rahma. Now, let's take in a few things into account. Allah, one of Allah's most powerful and overwhelming names is Ar-Rahman, the exceedingly loving and caring one. Okay, so they translate that as merciful. I've said often that I have a, I have a contention with the word mercy. Basically, the, the word Rahma comes from Rahm, which is the womb of a mother. So when she's carrying a baby, the womb is called the Rahm. Uh, and what that means is the child is in complete protection from the mom. And if there is any difficulty to be born, it will be absorbed by the mom. And while that's happening, the child is completely oblivious, has no recognition of the mother, has no acknowledgement of the mother, has no gratitude towards the mother, has no re gives the mother nothing back. It only takes, it doesn't give back. And yet the mother, with every passing day, only gives more love, more care, more protection, more concern, Right? And that relationship, which is basically a massively one-way relationship, where the one that's being cared for is causing more and more pain by the day, to the point where he's almost going to kill her. That's the point he's going to reach, where he's almost going to kill her. Right? And with each passing day, her love and care for that baby inside, the boy or the girl, is only increasing. It's not decreasing. And from it comes the word, one of the names of Allah, Ar-Rahim or Ar-Rahman even, right? Or dhur rahma even, another description of Allah. What does that mean? That Allah has us enveloped in His loving care. And most of the time, we are completely oblivious of how much love and how much care He's giving us. We have no way of recognizing how much is going into just keeping us alive. How much care from Allah is going into every breath that we're taking, every organ that we have functioning, every opportunity that we have in our lives, everything around our home that's being safe. There are car accidents in the city you live in right now, and you're not in them. That's a rahmah from Allah. There are places that have earthquakes and you're not there. And there are places where there are earthquakes and it hasn't hit you. There, there are diseases around you that many are inflicted with and you're not inflicted with. And that's a rahmah from Allah. And, there are, and even those that have been inflicted with the disease, there are those that could be in a much more difficult position and still you're in a rahmah from Allah. Whether we understand it or not, we're constantly being bombarded with the loving care from Allah. We're completely wrapped up in it. We live, we live and breathe it. Our existence is inside it. It's inside. It's not 
Allah is kind to us, or Allah is you know, loving towards us, or Allah is uh, um, caring towards us, we live inside Allah's love and care. It's from the imagery of Rahim, we're enveloped by it. Like you can't escape the oxygen, right? You're enveloped by it, you're surrounded by it. We're surrounded by the loving care of Allah. We exist only in it. Only in it. And Allah Azza wa has described this concept in the Quran. One tafsir of the ayah, إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ رَبُّكَ وَلِذَلِكَ خَلَقَهُمْ is he says, except for those he shows loving care to, and that's why he made them, meaning he only made them so he can show them loving care. Like, he only, the, the existence of the human being is an act of Allah's loving care. That, that's what it manifests as. Now, the thing, folks, is that for you and me, normal life, we recognize Allah's love and Allah's care when something good happens. We're just human. A baby is born, we're happy. Allah has been merciful. Allah is loving. Allah is caring. A problem gets solved. Allah is loving and caring. Right? Something we're hoping works out, works out. Allah is loving and caring. So whenever there's good news, we recognize that Allah is loving and caring. Whenever a difficulty is lifted, we recognize that Allah is loving and caring. So we associate the love and care of Allah with blessings around us, relief around us. This is what we associate the rahmah of Allah with. But the Qur'an is asking us to think about something more. Allah is, in a sense, Allah is telling us that every human being, believer, disbeliever, hypocrite, atheist, agnost, Hindu, Christian, Jew, you, Buddha, you name it, whatever religion or no religion or Muslim or just Muslim by name or conservative or liberal or whatever else, Hijab or no hijab, beard or no beard, salah or no salah, it doesn't matter. Every single human being is being cared for right now. Every one of them. Allah is ar-Rahman to all of them. They're all eating too. They're all breathing too. They all have good things in their life too. They have rizq too. They have protection too. They have angels guarding over them too. They have all of it. They have all of it. Just like we do. But there's something you have an opportunity to get that nobody else gets. So there's rahmah that we're already enveloped in, but then there's an extra rahmah. Now Allah already sends rahmah from the sky, the rahmah of provision, the rizq, the, the rahmah of our protection, right? He sends that from the sky anyway. But then He went out of His way to send a different rahmah that is above and beyond all of the other kinds of rahmah that He's ever given us. And that's the Qur'an. And where am I getting this idea from? That the Qur'an, the speech of Allah, talking to you and me, is Allah showing us love and care more than anything else that He does for us. He says in Surah Al-Rahman, Ar-Rahman, Allama Al-Qur'an, Khalaqa Al-Insan. Allamahu Al-Bayan. He says Ar-Rahman, He taught the Qur'an. He created the human being. Now wait a second. You would think, Ar-Rahman, He created the human being, He taught the Qur'an. The order is, we were created first, and then we were taught the Qur'an. But the order in Surah Al-Rahman is not about the order of chronology, obviously. You know what is the order of? The order of what is the bigger act of Allah being Ar-Rahman. The, the, even the, when Allah says He created us, then every blessing we enjoy comes under the umbrella of He created us. Our entire life, all of our experiences, all the things we, we, we consume, all the people we meet, all of that is under He created us. All the good you have in your life is under khalaqa, khalaq al-insan. But all of that combined is number two. And number one is Allah al-Qur'an, he taught the Qur'an. He taught, he taught his own word. So what that means for you and me is there is no greater act of Allah's love. And if someone wants to know how much Allah loves them, and how much Allah cares for them, then they will not experience how much love and how much care Allah has for them like they will when they come to Allah's book. This book. Now this is confusing. Because the Qur'an doesn't sound like it's loving and caring all the time, does it? He's talking about nations being destroyed. I remember telling you a story about a, a young woman who came to me in, in Massachusetts when I was done with the lecture. And she told me that she used to be a Muslim. And why are you not Muslim? Because, uh, you know, the way Allah talks about hell is too graphic. Why would a God that loves so much and cares so much, why is He grabbing people by the, having people grab by the forehead 
and being tossed into fires? Why are they being roasted? Why are they being fed pus? And why are they, you know, why is copper being pulled, poured down their mouths, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Right? Why is that? That doesn't sound like loving care at all. I was like, you got a point. How is that loving care? Well, here's how. I started by saying Allah has given us guidance, yeah? I started by saying there's such a thing as called as tough love. Punishing a human being is one thing. Warning a human being is something else. Allah is warning us, yes? He warned us. And the fact that Allah warned us is actually the biggest evidence that He doesn't want us to be punished. We, have, we don't recognize the tough love from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Look, there's a storm coming. If I care about you, I'll tell you, get out of the city, there's a storm coming, right? And then you say, how could you, how could you do this to me? How could you tell me there's a storm coming? I thought you gave me good news and made me feel better. <laughs> no. no, the reality is that I expect some higher things from you. And when you do the wrong, there are consequences. But I don't want you to suffer the consequences. I just want you to do the right thing. So I'm letting you know the storm's coming. And here's my way of, here's the way out. And the way out, I will support you every step of it. But if you want to go the wrong way, I won't stop you. You want to head towards destruction, I won't stop you. But if you want to go the right way, there will be challenges. And at every moment of every challenge, I will be by your side. That's Allah's promise. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا those who struggle in our path, we will absolutely guide them along every one, of our, every, every one of our pathways. What am I saying to you? That Allah's loving care is not separated from Allah's guidance. Right? It's one thing to love somebody on their own terms. So let's talk about that for a moment so you understand these two words together. Somebody could say, if you love me, you'll do this, this, this for me. Right? But what they want you to do is harmful. Does that ever happen? Can a child out of love ask to eat something that's harmful for them? Can, some, can, can a loved one out of there to prove your love to them, they want you to do something that's wrong? And it will hurt them and it will hurt you? Or either you or them or both? And you know that it's wrong? In other words, that love has demands that are misguided. Doesn't that happen? Love that has misguided demands. Allah gives us love. Allah gives us care. But Allah's loving care is always going to be based on reality, the truth, and guidance. It will always be guided love. In fact, it's so beautiful that in this surah previously, we saw the Yus Yusuf's brother that carried misguided love. You saw Zulaikha, the, the minister's wife, carried misguided love. And Allah describing His own words for us, says this, wor this, this book for you is guidance and loving care. So it's guided love. Those two things go hand in hand. So Allah Azza wa will steer us in the right direction even if it's painful. And even when you're going through that pain, Allah is telling you to go through that pain out of love for you. He gains nothing from it. I, you know, he, when He wants me to go through a change and a transition that's going to hurt, that's because He loves me. That's actually because He loves me. Even if he puts me through a difficult situation, it's because he loves me. But sometimes I don't understand, how can this be love? How can, if you love me so much, why, is it, why am I hurting so much? And it is in those moments that every other human being will wonder, where do I get the answer to that? How can God love me if, if this is what I'm going through? But you will have the word of Allah, and the word of Allah will make clear how he loves you. Look at what he did in the surah. Look at the, the, the placement of this phrasing. Did you not go through a story of a young boy who goes through things and you can question how can God love someone and do this to them? And did you not see throughout the story how much Allah loves him? And how that love manifests in its complete form in the end? It was always hidden all along, nobody else could see it. But Allah is latifun lima yasha. Allah was preparing him for something big. And Allah, more than anything else, it wasn't just about his life. Allah, every experience that he had, Allah was building him to prepare him and to make him wealthy, not in this life, but actually every one of those experiences were making him wealthier and wealthier in the next life, closer and closer to the one he loves most, Allah himself. He was actually getting him ready for himself. It wasn't, you, you think Yusuf was being prepared, prepared for kingdom. He was being prepared to save Egypt. More than any of those things, he was being prepared to meet his Rabb. That's what, because Allah loves him the most. All those experiences were there 
to climb through those experiences and to find a stronger and stronger faith in Allah and be with the one that he loves in the end, with Allah Azza wa Himself. So this notion of, you know, uh, uh, I actually wanted to, to show you this. Um, Anta waliyi fi dunya wal akhirah. Think about those words. The last words of Yusuf in the story. You are my protective friend in this life and the next. The whole story was about this life, yes? And how Allah has protected him in this life. But even he knows this was just a step to the real step. The next one. وَالْآخِرَةِ تَوَفَّنِي مُسْلِمًا وَالْحِقْنِي بِالصَّالِحِينَ Take me as, a, as someone who surrenders and join me among good people. Join me with good people. That, that's the final company Allah wants you to keep. Even Yusuf Alayhisam recognizes that. When Allah says that this is Rahmah, you, who's gonna have that long-term vision? The long view? You know, when you are at the bottom of a mountain, you can't see far. The higher up you go, the farther you can see, right? So your vision is blocked because you're too low. What does the Qur'an do? Qur'an elevates you. يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ Allah will elevate those among you who have faith and those who have been given knowledge. Given knowledge of what? His own word. He will raise them in ranks. The higher up they go, the better their view becomes. So what they saw as a problem, they realized was actually a step in the journey to something beautiful. They can see Allah's Rahmah. Just like Yusuf Alayhisam never lost sight of Allah's Rahmah. But he happened to be a prophet who revelation was given to, so he could never lose sight of Allah's Rahmah. What do you have, what do I have that Yusuf Alayhisam got from Allah directly? Well, we're not prophets, but Allah gave us His timeless word directly also. Come back to this word and you will find my Rahmah. You will find guidance and you will find Rahmah. You won't just find guidance. That's the other beautiful thing. Quran is not just to tell you, they're to tell you, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. It's not just guidance. It's guidance and it will always, with that guidance, show you how much He loves you and how much He cares for you. <laughs> it's so beautiful. He didn't have to do that. Allah is the ultimate authority. He could just tell us, do it and don't do it and that's it. He doesn't have to give us His loving care for, uh, for Him to have His authority over us. His word is decisive anyway. But He says, no, I know you. You lose hope. You fall into the trap of shaitan. You seek love in the wrong places then. You think that you can care for yourself better then, than I can. You start assuming that my love and care is not enough. You got to take care of your own business. So when I guide you, I guide you and I demonstrate my loving care to you. And for people who will develop a deep relationship with the Qur'an, they will see that come to life over and over again. That's not something you will study, that's something you will live. You'll live those words. You'll find that in Allah's words. And so he says, Hudan wa rahmatan li qawm. This is my favorite part of this phrasing, li qawmin yu'minun. It is a guidance and an act of loving care for a group of people, for any group of people. Qawmin can mean any group of people, which is amazing, right? Because Allah didn't say which group. And He didn't say, lil qawmil mu'minin, for the believing group. He didn't say that. He said, li qawmin. For any group of people. Now look at the language. Yu'minun. What happens in grammar, this, this is why Arabic grammar study is so important because it'll just make you stop in your tracks and then read the tafasir and you'll find an affirmation of what you're studying in Arabic. Qawmin is nakyara. It's common. And when yu'minuna, the present tense, the mudari' is used with it, what happens in Arabic is the mudari' can be used as a sifa, as an adjective. So you could say easily لِقَوْمٍ مُؤْمِنِينَ If the ism fa'il was used, it would be, the transition would be for a believing people. For a believing people. But the noun wasn't used here. The ism fa'il was not used. قَوْمٍ مُؤْمِنِينَ That would be an easy mausul sifa. This is a complex mausul sifa. قَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ What does that do? The, what the mudari' does when it comes after a nakira like this, is it becomes its adjective. So, which is weird. In English, we don't think of a verb as an adjective. We think of an adjective as an adjective. But when you put a verb as an adjective in Arabic, what it does, because verbs are considered by definition something that have a tense, past tense or present tense or future tense. So verbs by their nature in language are incomplete because they are partial in time. They're not constants, right? So they are incomplete concepts. And actually, correctly, 
uh, and very appropriately, in English grammar, the present tense is called the imperfect verb. The imperfect verb. That's what they call the present tense. Why? Because it's not done. If I say, for example, I'm eating or I'm talking, that means it's not done yet. So there's an imperfection to it, right? Now, what does that mean linguistically? What that simply means is not a nation that believes or a believing nation. That would be the adjective. But by using it as a verb, what that means is a nation or any group of people that is trying to get faith, that is struggling to have faith. It's not perfect. It's a work in progress. Allah says, this book will have guidance and it will show its loving care for somebody who feels like they have very little faith and they're not that great and they're, they're in the darkness of, of, of despair or they're, they've been in disobedience to Allah for a long time. What are they supposed to do? And even a person who feels like they're so far away from Allah, when they open up this book, they won't just find guidance. They will see that Allah still loves them. And even as they are, they're not perfect in their faith, they're journeying towards their faith, they're struggling to have their faith, or their faith was higher before, then it fell apart, they fell off the wagon a little bit, they messed up, and now they're trying to get back up, and they just disappointed Allah, and they're trying to get back up. There, there's an imperfection in the word yu'minun. They're trying, you could look at yu'minun as the, a, a group of people that want to have faith, that are trying to hold on to their faith, that are struggling with their faith, that are not quite complete in their faith that are on their way to having faith. All of those implications are inside the word yu'minuna. It's so powerful and beautiful that this word, is an in, this final ayah is actually an invitation. Almost like the two prisoners in the story at, in, the, in the prison of Yusuf a.s. Like an invitation. Allah is giving you an invitation if you're looking to find faith inside you. And even look at the word, I keep saying faith, 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 faith. It's yu'minun, which is amana yu'minu imanan from the if'al family. The origin of this word is amn. Amn actually means peace, safety, and security. And what we call amana to believe uh, is actually by extension. The original meaning of amana, which is also found in one of the names of Allah, al-mu'min, is to give safety. Is to give safety. No one feels more secure than someone who has faith. Someone looking to feel safe, someone looking to find calm inside them, is actually within the meanings of yu'minun. This is why Ibrahim alayhi salam says, "Fa'ayyul fariqayni ahqu bil amni in kuntum ta'lamun aladina amanu wa lam yalbasu imanahum bi zulmin." Which of the two groups is more deserving of peace and safety and calm? If you have any idea, those who have iman. So Amun and Amanu came in the same ayah like that to illustrate that. That there's a peace inside of you that if you're looking for it, you will find it when Allah gives you guidance. And that guidance may, may be difficult for you, but it will become easier as you internalize how much Allah loves you and cares for you. And as you live them, that's the other side of this. There's the understanding of it, right? I understand Allah is loving. I understand Allah is caring. But there's another side of it. When I start living by this guidance, when I start trying to hold on to my faith, not being perfect, trying, making an attempt to take the right steps, making an attempt to get away from the ways of shaitan, making an attempt to get away from disobedience to Allah, making an attempt to leave evil company behind, evil habits behind, making an attempt to do something good, or to undo something bad that I did. When I make those attempts, then I will see Allah is guiding me to more and more opportunities. And Allah is showing me more and more loving care. All because I'm committing myself to His words. Ma kana hadith. Now go back and just read that again. Ma kana hadith and yuftara. It's absolutely not any just sort of made up frivolous speech. Do you know what you're dealing with here? You're dealing with the most valuable treasure you can possibly have in your possession. Nothing will bring you the kind of safety, the kind of calm and the kind of peace that Quran will give you. Which leads me, leads me to another point. Another discussion. People say, I just want to be happy. You can't, I can't be happy if I'm not at peace. I just can't be. I can't be happy if I don't feel safe. I need internal peace, calm, and safety in order to be what? Happy. And when I don't have those things, then I can play video games. Then I can watch a movie. Then I can take a trip. Then I can, you know, go out and eat. Then I can hang out with friends and go to a party. And all of it will be me masking and faking and pretending that there's a deep 
deep-seated dissatisfaction, a lack of tranquility, a lack of peace, a lack of safety, and insecurity, and anxiety that's keeping it's deep inside. I just want to bury it with parties. I want to bury it with food. I want to bury it with pizza. I want to bury it with video games. I want to bury it with movies. I want to bury it with Netflix or whatever else. I want to bury it, bury it, bury it because I, I can't deal with it. Because when I don't have those things to distract me from what I really feel inside, then it's a really dark place that I'm in. And so people say, I just need to go get a drive. I need to go take a walk. I need to go do something. You know why? Because something inside is not letting you go. You don't have amn inside. You don't have that, that peace inside, that safety deep inside. Everybody wants it. But we say, I want to be happy. So what do we say? We, we, we're not going to take care of our internal peace and our safety. We're just going to run after some kind of what? Happiness. And every attempt to find happiness when you don't have the inside, it keeps falling apart. So you keep looking for a new and new and new high. Maybe for a moment you watched a comedy and you laughed and you confused that laughter with happiness. That's not happiness. That's just a knee-jerk reaction. You're still deeply sad. You're still deeply troubled inside. What does Allah say about that? He said... Describing the same Qur'an قَدْ جَاءَتْكُمْ مَوْعِظَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ He said, what has come to you for sure, what has come to you is How do I describe مَوْعِظَةٌ? It's advice that goes inside your heart. That's مَوْعِظَةٌ Powerful advice that goes deep inside your heart has come to you. That's the first description of the Qur'an in that ayah. Second description. And it heals what's inside the chest. It's a healing for what is inside the chest. Quran is not just stories, it's not just beautiful sounds. There's something inside me that hurts. And Allah says, I can heal it. I'm, I've given you words that heal it because I know what you're feeling. No one knows your heart like Allah does. And no one can heal it like Allah does. So He sent out of His loving care, His rahmah, shifa'un lima fi sudur, the healing for what goes inside the chest. Then He said, wahudan, and guidance. When your heart starts feeling healed, you don't want it to get hurt again, do you? Because when you're recovering, you don't want to go back into the sixth state. So Allah says, now that you've felt some of that healing, I'll guide you so you never trip up again. And then he says, وَرَحْمَةً The same way he says here, وَرَحْمَةٌ An act of loving mercy. All of those descriptions of the Qur'an. But you know what he says right after that? Because if you're healed inside the chest, you're safe. You have iman. He says, قُلْ فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُوا Tell them, because of that, they should then feel real joy. <laughs> Think about that ayah. It's the only place Allah talks about being happy. Only place in the whole Quran. I wonder it all the time. How come Allah doesn't talk about happiness so much? He talks about calm, tranquility, peace. He talks about trusting Allah. He talks about fearing Allah. He talks about guidance. He doesn't talk about happiness. And then I realized something. In, the, in just my thoughts, thoughts about this ayah today, I realized this. It is only when Allah fills the void of lack of safety and lack of peace inside your heart and my heart with His words, then you can experience happiness. Then after that, you can experience true joy. فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُوا And then He adds even a heavier comment. He says, well, خَيْرٌ بِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ It is better than everything they're gathering. Man, people are collecting and collecting and collecting. What are they collecting? They're collecting distractions they, th they think that will make them happy. They're collecting money that think they, they think will make them happy. Collecting clothes, collecting shoes, collecting purses, collecting gadgets and toys, collecting friends, collecting views on social media. You know? That's what you're collecting. You think that's going to make you happy? It's going to fill some kind of void? Because it's interesting? Because it's fun. If you deep down inside ask yourself where you stand and how jittery you become without those distractions, how unhinged, unhinged, like how unstable almost without those distractions. Because when, you're, when you don't have those distractions, you have to fa face your real, dissatisfied, you know, scared, vulnerable self. 
That's what you have to face. Because those are just drugs. When, you, when somebody's on drugs, they're not there. They're not in their conscious state. So we've created alternatives to drugs too. They're not just illicit chemical drugs that we induce into our bodies or inject into our bodies. Now we have virtual drugs, right? We have drugs of, of different kinds of habits that are just as strong an opiate as any to distract us from what's really going on inside of us. This ayah is so powerful. It's so beautiful. Because every other way, every other place I turn and listen to a story, it's there to distract me from my life. <laughs> I watch a movie because I don't want to think about what's going on with me. I just want to have a good time. Check out for a few, few hours. For an hour and a half, you're watching stuff get blown up. You're watching a fight, you're watching this, that, you're watching action drama or whatever. You're crying, you're, you're fe feeling their fake emotions. But you're not thinking about your life. For those 90 minutes, you shut yourself off. Your life didn't exist. You're vicariously living through these characters on the screen. That's what you're doing. And here you have the Qur'an telling you a story. Just like a movie tells you a story. Just like a novel tells you a story. Just like a video online tells you a story. Just like a video game tells you a story. They're stories, aren't they? But this story, instead of you reading it and checking out from your life and being immersed in these characters and this fiction and what's going to happen in the next season, every word in this story is a commentary about them. And yet, at the same time, it is a commentary about me. It's actually making me look at my life and then look, make me look at my life again. This is not like any other story. Other stories are actually literally made up for the purpose of distracting and entertaining you. مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى وَلَكِنْ تَصْدِيقَ الَّذِي بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ What's such a beautiful realization about this ayah is when in the beginning Allah says لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ In their story, in their narrative, there is a powerful, profound lesson. لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ For the people of, the, of sound minds. We talked about sound minds before. People free of distraction. Remember that? And at the end he says, there's a second li. So the first li was لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ And the second li is لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ For the people of sound minds, for a people that are seeking to have faith. For a people that are struggling with their faith. You know what? They're one and the same. Allah is showing us two sides of the same coin. The people of the soundest minds are people that are seeking to find that peace inside them even if they have, they're not even close to it yet. They've just taken one step in a thousand mile journey. That's okay. They're still ulil al-bab. They'll see it. They'll get there. So you know when in the beginning you felt like this ayah is talking about people that already have a level of spiritual and intellectual maturity. Ulil al-bab. And by the end Allah says, no, no, no. This word is for anyone who wants to get to ulil al-bab because they're struggling to actually find that inner peace inside of them, that tranquility and that iman and that safety inside them. So, وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ this is, the, this is an ayah which not only sheds light on the entire story that we've studied of Surah Yusuf, but it sheds light on how we are to approach the Qur'an altogether. The Qur'an is a labor of love, is a journey of love, is me discovering not just Allah's guidance, but Allah's rahmah for me. Think about that. The same one who gave me my, my, my parents, my children, the same one who gave me my limbs, the one who has so much love for me in everything that he's done for me. I can see his love for me on my body. I can see it on the, with the, on the clothes on my back. I can see it in the car that I'm going to sit in. I can see it in the workplace that I go to. I can see it in everything around me is an act of Allah's love. Because without Allah's love and Him caring, I couldn't have had what I have. Any of it. Any of it. And that one went out of his way after everything he's done for me. He said, no, but I want to give you my words too. I want to talk to you too. And my words will protect you. And my words will give you strength. And my words will remind you of how much I love you. And my words will envelop you in my rahmah like nothing else will. You're already in my rahmah, but there's a rahmah above and beyond that, that's the Qur'an. So we're like in rahmah squared, the believer. We're, we're, in a, we're in a state that, why would anybody want to walk away from that? Why would anybody want to get, not give it its time? Not give it its due. You know? I'm terrified of that. 
ayah where Allah describes His Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam on ju- Judgment Day, and He says, "Ya Rabb, inna qawmi taqadu hadha al-Qur'an mahjura." My master, this nation of mine, took the Qur'an as something to be abandoned. They considered the Qur'an something worthy of being left behind. Mahjura, it's a maf'ul, something left behind, something hijrah is done from. It doesn't belong in our time. It's just, no, 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 it's not relevant for this situation. No, I'm going through a real problem. Don't tell me about Qur'an. I'm going through a real problem right now. <laughs> Nothing is more real than the solution Allah will give. Give it a shot. Open the word of Allah. Ask Allah for guidance. Ask Allah for His loving care. His guarantee is He'll give it. His guarantee, absolute guarantee is that He will give it. You know, Allah destroyed previous nations, one after the other, that defied their messengers. And in Surah Al-Qamar, and I'll leave you with this thought, in Surah Al-Qamar, he talks about the destruction of one nation, and he says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ We made the Qur'an easy. Is there anyone who will put an effort to remember? Then he talks about another nation destroyed. Then he says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ then another nation destroyed. وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ We made the Qur'an easy. We made the Qur'an. Nation destroyed, we made the Qur'an easy. Another nation destroyed, we made the Qur'an easy. Another nation destroyed, we made the Qur'an easy. What is he saying? Why is he talking like that? He's saying, I know how to set people straight. And I've done it before. I've set people straight by what? When they defied me, what did I do with them? I wrecked them. When they crossed a certain line, there was no trace of them left. But for you, instead of destroying you, I decided to talk to you more and more. And you defy me more and I talk to you more. You Quraysh, you insult my messenger. I could destroy you like I destroyed the people of Nuh. I could destroy you like the like Fir'aun. I've destroyed much worse. You think you're big and bad? I've taken out the pharaohs. Allah Azza wa Jal makes that list and says, by the way, and what did I do for you? I didn't just give you the Qur'an, I made the Qur'an easy. I made it easy for anybody who wants to remember. That's the surah that comes right before Surah Al-Rahman, Al-Rahman Allam Al-Qur'an. Why? Because Allah is saying, you know, like a teacher, like, you know, where I come from in Pakistan, you can, some of you know this all too well. Um, when a student is not behaving, what can the teacher do in Pakistan that they can't do in America? Apparently, I found out in some southern states, they even do, they, they have... Teachers can whip the student, give them, a, you know, spanks. They could do that. I mean, not in New York. You go to jail. But in Pakistan, that's like, uh, you know, it's like considered good for the child's sinuses. I'm not, I'd never condone hitting children, by the way. But it was something I've experienced even as a kid. When, if you're accused of talking during class, <laughs> it's coming. Your sinuses are about to be cleared. A big old smack on the back of your head. Now, a teacher can discipline by way of talking, and a teacher can discipline by way of what? Punishing. Allah can discipline those who defy Him any way He wants. Any way He wants. And He decided to the worst of people, that were the worst to the Prophet They were the worst to Him. He decides to just give them Qur'an. And give them more Qur'an. And they get worse, He warns them more. Warns them, warns them, warns them. Even in the harshest warnings, there's love. Because there's other things Allah can do. Can't He? And He says, I've done it before. Plenty of times. Why are you acting like those people? I'm not doing that to you. I'm talking to you. That's even in the most negative circumstances, Allah is showing us His loving care. Now for us, someone who's seeking to believe, someone who's seeking to come to Allah, Allah Azza wa will open this, this, this book for them. He'll open their mind Allah will make the path of guidance easy. Allah will give you His loving care when you say, Ya Allah, I want to learn your word. Because I want your guidance. I want to feel your word inside my heart. I want that tranquility inside. I want that, what the Prophet ﷺ described, Hu ahablu Allah al-mateen min as-sama ila al-ard. It's the extended rope of Allah from the sky to the earth. That's the, that's the Qur'an. Like what Allah calls, وَاَعْتَصِبُ بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا Hold on to Allah's rope. When you make that decision, who's going to make it easy? Who's going to make the alphabet easy, who's going to make Arabic studies easy, who's going to make tafsir studies easy, who's going to make contemplating the Qur'an easy, who's going to make making the time for the Qur'an easy, who's going to make it all easy? That's going to be Allah. He loves you so much 
that not only did he give you this and say, now put the work in, as you're putting the work in, Allah says, I'll keep making it easy for you too. That's not love? <laughs> That's not love? We should struggle to come up to the standard of Allah's word. And Allah says, no, I'll make it easier for you. I'll, I'll interject, I'll have divine interjection, and I'll open your mind, and I'll open your heart, and make things easier for you. That's Allah's promise. So when Allah Azza wa Jal concludes this ayah with وَتَفْصِيلَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ Those who already believe, those who are struggling with their faith, those who feel like they've drifted too far away, an invitation is given to all of them to come back to Allah's loving word. To all of them. May Allah Azza wa Jal help us accept that invitation and truly be able to benefit from that, the acceptance of that invitation inside of our hearts. This is not something that you and I can... Uh, explain to anyone else. This is something that in the end, the mo no matter how much I talk about it, this, this is something that can only be experienced. It cannot be, we can talk about it in theory, but in the end of the day, at the end of the day, this is something you as an individual must experience for yourself. And I pray that you're able to do that. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. No, I'm not doing the table thing today. <laughs>